<laughs> it's, it, I, you know, this is United States District Court. They just put a lot of people in jail. Um, and they try real hard to, um, to try to treat white-collar criminals as severely as they treat non-white-collar criminals. Okay. Part of the plea bargaining process, though, assuming that your client doesn't want to uh, be a cooperating witness, what, doesn't really leave you with a lot of ammunition, does it normally? Um, in the plea bargaining process? No, it doesn't, because if it's a, if it's a, a, a mild offense, if it's not a terribly serious offense, the only thing your client's going to get is a two-level reduction from the sentencing guidelines, which generally um, translates into maybe a, maybe a six-month reduction. Can you explain how that works? What do you mean by a two-level well, reduction? There's a... Um, this, you'll see this book. This is the Federal Sentencing Guidelines, which, right. which deals with all of the offenses that are set forth in, in federal criminal law and assigns a number to them. So you take that number that corresponds, which is called the, bait, the offense level, and it's a grid. And then across the top is the criminal history score. So you take the offense level and you look at the prior criminal record, and there are certain points that are attributed to prior criminal conduct, and you arrive at a number where they both meet. That's the sentencing range. Okay. It's usually two numbers, you know, uh, 36 to 48 months, something to that effect. And the okay. judge can choose. Now, that's just advisory. There was a time until just a few years ago when that was hard, fast law. I think there's been some litigation in the United States Supreme Court, though, right? Yes, that now this is just advisory. But the judge still, if the judge is going to, is going to um, divert from that substantially, either up or down, he really needs to make a record. Now, the uh, two... Um um, what's the word I'm thinking of? The two, the two point departure? Yeah, two point, well, it's a two point downward adjustment for pleading guilty. Okay, so that's. If, if it's a more serious offense and it's over a level 16, base of level 16, you get three points down. So it's something basically that you get credit for actually saving them the time, uh, the time trouble, and effort of a trial right. and acknowledging your, your wrongdoing, so to speak. Right. But it doesn't necessarily turn out to be much. For example, if it's a serious offense and your base offense level is 35 and you plead guilty, you're only going to get three levels off. What does that give you, though, 32 as opposed to 35? I could tell you. All right. I'll tell you real quick. The, uh, 30 I'm not sure I want to know. <laughs> well, at 35, if you have no prior criminal record, um, a 35 is 168 to 219 months, 210 months, 168 to 210. If you go down to a 32, it's 121 to 151. Well, you know. So, uh, so, so you know, on, on the, it's three-year difference. So it's, uh, you know, talking. 15 years instead of 20. Uh, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot of time. That's for a guilty plea. That's for um, putting yourself in that situation for, for, with the words out of your own mouth. Is there, any, um, is there anything else you can use as a, as a lever for the defense perspective in terms of plea bargaining, apart from cooperating witness and uh, pleading guilty? There really isn't a whole lot more um, in, in a plea. You can, you can bargain the facts of the case. The, uh, <clears throat> the, um, the guideline application... Um, is supposed to be um, right on with the facts of the case. So you really can't fudge it. If the tax that was due and owing was $200,000, right. you can't agree with the U.S. attorney, well, look, we're not going to really say it was $2,000. We're going to really say that it was $50,000 to keep the guidelines down. You can't do it right. because um, the U.S. probation office does an investigation and does a pre-sentence report and submits that to the court prior to the sentencing and they're going to find out what the facts are anyway. Even if there had been a civil settlement between the IRS and the defendant for some lesser amount? Right, even, even if there was a civil settlement for a lesser amount. How about in drug cases? Is there some latitude in terms of the amount of the, uh, you know, what they're saying that he distributed or possessed? There's always some latitude because in, in a drug case, uh, it's generally always a conspiracy situation. Right. And so you've got a, a you know, number of individuals participating in a larger conspiracy to distribute a fairly substantial amount of drugs. The, the standard is that any particular defendant is responsible under the application of the guidelines for the amount of drugs that was reasonably foreseeable to him. Okay. So that has been the subject of a great deal of litigation. So that's some place where you can argue with the U.S. attorney and say, well, look, you know, uh, his total distribution was not 25 kilos of cocaine, but, mm -hmm. you know, it was, he, he didn't know what the other people were doing. It was more reasonably foreseeable to him that it was only 10. So you have a little bit of latitude. You have a little bit of latitude. And that'll affect the, uh, the downward departure? The, yeah, the, 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 that will add, not the departure. The departure is something different, but it will affect the application of the guidelines. And you can also often just plead open or agree to leave these issues open for the court. You have a sentencing hearing. You have a sentencing hearing. 
Ever since Hoover, it has been the policy of the FBI, the policy of the FBI, not to record interviews, mm -hmm. no matter how important they are. The FBI does not record interviews. And Hoover's reason was that the FBI doesn't need to record statements. We are the FBI. And that if an FBI agent takes the witness stand and takes the oath, that's good enough. Okay. So um, what I tell my clients often, whether the FBI agent has good motive, bad motive, or otherwise, the real difficulty happens is when he sits down and speaks to an FBI agent, that the reality is not necessarily what he said, but what the FBI agent wrote in the 302. Well, there's another <clears throat> side of this coin, though, it seems to me, I, because my experience has been that when the FBI shows up to talk to you, they're really not going to get any new information. In other words, they're so well prepared, they know ahead of time what they're looking for, what the answer should be. And I think where you get into trouble is where you give the FBI false information during your interview. Do you agree with that? I mean, in terms of the level of their preparation when they go for the interview in the first place? It's generally true. They're not really looking for information. What they're looking for is a confession, mm -hmm. okay? They're looking for admissions, <coughs> they're right. looking for, 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 for the client or the, for what they the target to make statements that's gonna end the discussion and gonna close down the prosecution. Now they've got them. Right. And, and that's what you really have to be careful because sometimes a client will talk to, to the FBI and they'll say certain things and then you look at the 302, which is the designation for the FBI report, and you read what the FBI report uh, says that the client said, and you talk to the client, and the client says, well, I didn't say that. Well, that's not what I meant. Mm -hmm. So the reality breaks down between what the client says and what the FBI thinks he said or whatever the FBI wrote. 